This teaching is about how to live our lives in the spirit, and it's basically a follow-up. I would recommend the look at the other teaching on righteousness um, that we have here on YouTube as well. So these two go together. So again, if you're, you've been made righteous, again, look at that, that um, whole teaching and you'll see that we have been made righteous. It's something that we don't have to work for, it's already done for us. We, he has been made sin for us and we have been made righteous. Uh, Hebrews talks about their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And Colossians, we are holy, unblameable, irre irreprovable. So we have a clean conscience, our conscience is purged of sin, the feelings of guilt have gone, and the New Testament is very clear, our sins have been forgiven, our co conscience completely cleansed of all sin by the blood of Jesus, so we have been made righteous. And again, when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, this is something that you, that you have been given and you are made, and it's not something you work at, work at. So you have to actually just believe, understand this from the Word of God, and believe and know that you've been made righteous. So I'm going to talk today about living in the Spirit. And this is about sanctification and holiness, and this is something that you do have to work at. So we're going to get into this. So Paul talks about in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 5, about two stages in the Christian life. And we're going to look at these two stages in the Christian life, and we're going to talk about how to live, again, in the Spirit. So the power of the flesh, uh, that's one, that's one, Paul's talking about the power of the flesh, the, um, and he's talking also about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, living our lives in the Spirit. And again, in Corinthians here, Paul's assuming that they have been baptized in the Spirit. Um, he doesn't talk about much about the Pentecost, but obviously they all knew at Pentecost. Paul talk, talked about Pentecost, so he's assuming, and the Corinthians were speaking in tongues. So he knew they were, and that's, again, <laughs> not, not a doctrine that if you're not baptized in the Spirit, uh, that's a doctrine out there. Uh, you, a lot of people, I believe, are, are baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and don't speak in tongues because they haven't, they haven't really tried to speak in tongues. But anyway, that's a different subject. But we're talking about the power of the flesh and living our lives in the Spirit. And I would recommend, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I would highly recommend it. And as you go through this teaching today here, you'll see how important it is. I'm pretty sure you'll see how important it is that uh, Paul emphasizes life in the Spirit connected to the baptism in the Spirit and then living in the Spirit. So, to find out, we, Paul wanted to find out, you know, what, which, were they in the carnal or were they, were they in the flesh? Were they in the carnal or were they in the Spirit? And he said to them, I could not speak unto you as, as to spiritual, but unto carnal, even unto babes in Christ. So he, they were in Christ, they were real Christians, but they were feeble Christians. He said, For hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet are you able to, for you to, for you are yet carnal. So he's talking about the carnal and the spiritual. And that's what we're going to get into here and talk about in some detail. So as serious Christians, we're all trying to get closer to God. I think that's that's true and we know that God's word promises perfect peace it speaks of a faith that overcomes the world and a joy that is unspeakable and this is what we're looking for so let us we want to attempt here to discover what the hindrances are that keep many of us from experiencing a fulfilled Christian life and what are the necessary steps for one to enter into uh, the life in the spirit so that's what this teaching is all about uh, be patient. It's a little detailed, and uh, it do, we we do talk initially about the carnal state, and then we get into the seven blessings from from um, chapter eight in, in Romans, and that will give us the answer to some of these questions that you may be looking for. And I would say to listen to it again, and again, and again, because um, at first glance here you might not be able to pick up all the uh, nuances here about what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And Paul says plainly that I want you to know that you're a carnal believer. So, you know, there's no question about this. Uh, and, and again, here comes the proof. For whereas <clears throat> there were among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Carnal comes from a Latin word meaning flesh. Works of the flesh, this proves you're carnal. You walk as men do, not as children of God, who, who lead a heavenly life. So one says, I am a Paul, other, I am apostle, I am of Apollos, <clears throat> and yet you are not carnal. For the fourth time, you have the word carnal, and for the second time, the very point question for them to answer is, tell me, are you not carnal? 
So we want to look at ourselves here and see are we in the carnal and are we in the spiritual. And for a lot of us, it's a, it's a bit of both. But what we're trying to do is explain this and open it up so as you realize there are two places you can live in here. So this is what we're going to look at. What is the difference between the spiritual and the carnal Christian? And how do we get from carnal to spiritual? Let me say again that I think a lot of us, you know, we don't want to get into too much condemnation here, but a lot of us, you know, go from the carnal to the spiritual and we go back and forth. What we're trying to do here, what this teaching is all about, is trying to look and see and understand that the, that the spiritual life is possible. And that's what God wants for us, for all of us, for all Christians. So we need to look at it like Paul did, look and see exactly, and we need to check ourselves, am I still carnal? Or am I by the grace of God spiritual? We must know what our carnal state is, otherwise the knowledge of the spiritual life cannot be of any real benefit. So we must know if we're carnal or spiritual. And for most of us, we're kind of both. We're, we, we go in both places. <clears throat> so let us pray. Give us, Father, we just ask for the grace uh, to search us and to see if, if we are carnal. Let us discover today and open up the way into a spiritual life to live as, as a spiritual man. We ask this in Jesus' name. So if we look carefully at this passage, we shall find four parts of the carnal state. And this is, you know, it's, again, it's fairly, it's, it's fairly true for most of us. Um, so one, it's a state of pr protracted infancy, that we're babes. The carnal state is, is usually a state of sin and failure. We we're trying, we're trying to get rid of sin and we're not, we're failing. And the third one is that we may be baptized in the Spirit, and yet our private lives may be filled with pride. This is, a, again, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul made this very clear. That you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and yet, you know, live a carnal life. The carnal state brings an incapacity for receiving spiritual truth. So this is something that we need to look at as well, because it's very difficult sometimes to see real spiritual truth. And and that's why that's why Paul was saying you're babes, because you weren't, you weren't able to see spiritual truth so if you're in a carnal state it's a very diff you're di it's difficult to receive spiritual truth so let's look at these four issues and see if we can identify some of these things in our own lives and i'm sure we will i mean i do and uh, i'm working on it so this is something that we need to work on but what we do need to know is we need to know this is a reality and that god through paul here was showing the corinthians and showing us that this is something where he wants us to grow he wants us to become more like Jesus, because the life in the Spirit is, is becoming more like Jesus. So it's a, it's a state of protect, protected infancy. We look at a beautiful little child six months old, but if in three years that child has not grown an inch, we'd look at that and we'd say something's really wrong with the child. After three or four years of no growth, uh, we would look at that child and say there is, there is a real problem here. So Paul is saying, you are young Christians, babes in Christ, there is something wrong. And that we can see very clearly when we talked about a child. So a Christian under the power of the flesh remains a child for a long time. This is the, this is the point Paul is making. And he also makes it in Hebrews. And he also talks about this life in the Spirit in, in Galatians and in Ephesians. And we're not going to go there. It's just, uh, you know, but I, I might mention it a little bit here and there. But this is a, the life in the Spirit is all throughout the New Testament. And Paul is emphasizing it in a lot of places. So in Hebrews, he's talking about that they had been so long Christians, they ought to be teachers helping others. But they had still to be fed with milk and were not able to take the meat of, of the full-grown man. So what are the marks of a babe? One is, it, one is that a babe cannot help himself. He's got to be helped by others. The other, he can't help anybody else. Look at a baby in a house. You've got to have mother or sister or somebody take care of, taking care of that baby. And again, this is why, why Paul is emphasizing this uh, remaining remaining a child and we must come out of that state a little baby needs always to be helped and cared for and you know this is the way with many of us really we go to church prayer meetings conferences and we're always seeking help from others a little infant of six months old cannot help somebody else so we have Christians who can't really help others by their spiritual experience so let's test ourselves if there be no healthy growth in us, let us let us bow before God and repent, and say, "Okay, uh, thank you, Jesus. I can see this now. The Holy Spirit, I see this uh, as a problem in my life, and I'm going to get past this. I'm going to I'm going to do something about it. 
I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to walk. I'm going to make my life. I'm going to look at it. I realize that I'm a babe. I need, I need to have some growth. So let's, we'll, and we'll talk about how, how to get into this. So again, we're going through the four steps here of the carnal state, and then we'll talk about how to fix it. So, but these four carnal states is, I'm sure a lot of us can recognize some of these things that Paul's talking about here. So the carnal state is a state of sin and failure, no victory over sin. Again, this is not for everybody. A lot of people that are, that are actually um, have, have victory over sin. Uh, but if you haven't, and I, I've worked with a lot of people who are good Christians, they're trying really hard, uh, but they're in sin. They have the sin. Again, I've just mentioned pornography because it's something that's difficult to come out of. Uh, of course you can come out of it, and of course you can get dominion over it. But again, if you're in this carnal state, uh, this is this is the problem. And again, don't believe that you can't come out of this thing because you can. You can get to a place where you can have dominion over sin. But this is usually where the, where the person is. is if they're in the carnal state, and sin is sin and failure, no victory over sin. And Paul says to the Corinthians that he had the, he had the same problem. They were envying, strife, and divisions. That was the work of the flesh because of their quarreling. One exalted, one exalted Paul, another Apollos, and they were divided into religious parties. Have we seen that since those days? I mean, look, look at the state of the Christian church and denominations. And a lot of that is a carnal state. They were just squabbling over themselves. They had strifes, divisions, and envy. And we can see that also amongst ourselves as well. So in Galatians 5, you have strifes, envying strifes as the works of the flesh. So how many of us have the grace of God and yet never really conquer our tempers? And this is a great test for, for a carnal life. If you haven't conquered your temper, or you're moody, or you're complaining, or you're moaning, uh, or you're, you're, you're talking negative, that is a clear state of the, that's a clear carnal state. And so when another says to us a sharp thing to us, we give a sharp reply. I mean, who, who, how many of us have been there? And yet that's where God doesn't want us there. He wants us to grow from that. How many Christians there are who have never learned to love as God wants us to love, to love the unlovable? This is an example also of the carnal state. And, you know, I know I've been here. Um, how do I love the, the homosexual? How do I love the unloved? How do I love the people that even though they're in sin, I still love them? And again, how do I, will I, will I go out of my way to show my love for people even what it, so I bring the gospel to them even though they might reject me completely? So again, that's the carnal state. And I think you can see now what's going on here. Paul's very clear, and that's why I love the scriptures because there's so much wisdom in these scriptures. They, they clearly paint a picture. And I think we can, we can say, yes, I see some of that in myself. So... In them, the, in them, the flesh had more power than the spirit. And until we confess with shame, I'm carnal, we will not get, will not get into the life of a spiritual man. So I'm going into detail here, and uh, we could move on, but I think it's important to just stay here and go into the details. And uh, so, two powers are striving for mastery over us: the spirit and the flesh. And if the spirit is not ruling us, is because the flesh is ruling. This is why we give way to pride, self-conceit, worldliness, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Paul says, Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost that, that dwelleth in you? There was somewhat of the Spirit in them, but they had allowed the flesh to rule. Here we're talking about the Corinthians again. Because this is the point that Paul's making. And the question for us is, Are ye not carnal? That worldliness, that neglect of God's word. We have not given ourselves wholly over to live the spiritual life. So that's what we're setting up here how to live the spiritual life. So this is the third mark of the carnal state. Remember we have four marks of the carnal state, so we're going through the third one and the fourth one, and then we get on to the remedy. <laughs> but the carnal state, can, and again, we're going through these, these issues, these four issues, and we're going into detail here because I think that, that these four states, we, we, can, we, can apply, we can see ourselves here. Not in all of them, but we can see ourselves in some. So that's why I'm walking through these things and slowly and in detail. So the carnal state can have lots of spiritual gifts. Paul says, I thank God that in everything you are enriched in him, in all utterance and in all knowledge. So the Corinthians were, had spiritual gifts, the gifts of prophecy, tongues, and many miracles and other gifts. And yet they were full of quarreling, pride, and selfishness. So a man may have a spiritual gift of preaching or be able to speak with power or be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and yet his private life may be filled with pride. This is true. A man may be an evangelist, lead hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of Christ, 
and yet you will hear it said how full of self that person is, or how full of pride it is, very prideful or arrogant. This is true for all of us. And we can be in a place where we do a lot of great things for God, and yet be full of uh, being a carnal state. This is what Paul is making, this is the point Paul is making here. Can it be that a man who is powerful, a powerful man in the service of God can be carnal? Yes. And that's what Paul is saying here. So we, we can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but lack in the graces of a holy life in humility, gentleness, tenderness before God and man. Because we don't realize, we don't realize that there are two states here that Paul was ta- very clearly talking about and also talks about in Galatians and in, in, um, in Ephesians. They had spiritual gifts of prophecy, tongues, miracles, yet they were unwilling to be subject to one another. There, there was strife. And if there's strife and divisions, like Paul was saying, then they're, they're, they were carnal. So a man may be a preacher, teacher, evangelist, organizer, and yet God may say to that man and may say to us, may say to you and me, are you not carnal? And so we come to the fourth st- state uh, where it can be difficult to receive spiritual truth. Paul was making this point as well. So they had, they, the Corinthians had received the mystery of God but, but can't tell you. A lot of people, we know the gospel, but we can't seem to get it out to people. Uh, we want to, and we know the gospel. We know, we understand exactly what happened on the cross. We have a difficult time getting it across. And Paul was saying, you know, looking at the Corinthians, uh, were the Corinthians stupid? No, there were great secrets after wisdom. We know this. They prided themselves upon their knowledge. We know that as well. They were enriched in all knowledge, what Paul says. They were a cultured, thoughtful people, and yet Paul said, all your wisdom will not help you. If I were to speak spiritual truth, you would take it into a carnal mind and intellect, and it would be of no good to them. So Paul says, I must let them know that they're carnal and bring them to the point of realizing that they're carnal. So we must bring ourselves to the point where we recognize that we may be carnal. The carnal state is incapable of receiving spiritual truth. So there's the four points we talked about that Paul made, made very clear in Corinthians. So Paul did not want the Corinthians to rest in this carnal state. The reason he brought all this up, the reason we went into so much detail here, is because we want to pass from the carnal to the spiritual. That is what we need too. We need to pass from the carnal to the spiritual. And the question comes, how are we to get from one to the other? And this is what's exciting, because there is an answer. So we went through all this detail to get to this point where we can bring up the carnal state and show that we, that that it's very possible that we could be in be, we could be carnal in some of these areas and then that should that should encourage us to get to a place where we can get to the spiritual state so we're delivered from the curse of sin now i want deliverance from the power of sin and there's no deliverance but by becoming an entire spiritual man ruled by the holy spirit and we must be able to see and believe that the spiritual life is a possibility. For a lot of people, they don't, they've not seen this, this um, contrast before. So we must, and Paul's pointing out to us here and in other places in the New Testament, that the carnal life is there and the spiritual life is there and the spiritual life is a possibility. That there is a spiritual life which is a, it's our duty to live. That there is a spiritual life we're, we are in need of and may claim. So, the good news. We'll look at the 16 verses of the 8th chapter of Romans, in which the Holy Spirit is mentioned a number of times, and a man must begin to see that God wants him to be a spiritual man. He does not want us to be carnal. So, in Romans 8 is a great example of the seven uh, basic steps there of, of, this, of, of living in the Spirit that Paul talks about, as an example that how we can get to be a spiritual man and walk and live in the Spirit. So a spiritual life is possible, so I want to say, oh God, I, I know this, I, and I want to become a spiritual man. When we are convinced of a spiritual life, or of a carnal life, and we believe in the possibility of a spiritual life, we'll become to the third step. And the third step really here is to want this, to want to, to, want, to want to be in this, have a life that is in the Spirit, and walk in the Spirit. But are we willing to give up everything to get the spiritual life? Because this, this kind of sometimes bring us, brings us to a time of struggling. Uh, a great man delight to read about the spiritual life, but that's not enough. At what price? What do we have to give up? What must we sell to get the pearl of great price? 
what is it going to cost to to buy the pearl of great price the pearl of great price <laughs> every desire of the world all temper everything you love your whole life your whole self and you must place that in possess in the possession of Christ and again this can be a struggle here because we got to give up we got to give up you know basically our life and live the life that Jesus wants us to live so there's a cost and again Jesus said if you follow me you must you must die you must give up everything and and be fully given up to God you know it's only in the vessel that is fully cleansed and empty that the Holy Spirit can do his work the New Testament talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit filled with the Holy Spirit well that means that there must be an emptiness we must be empty to be filled so when a man gives up all he can claim the promise and believe that he received it that's the prayer that Jesus said uh, when you ask for something you believe that you have it so may God in his mercy open the vi eyes of all his people to discern the two states of the carnal and the spiritual may bring many to the acceptance of the sp full spiritual life he has provided in Christ Jesus so God wants us to look at the spiritual life and know it was, it's within with it reach so now we're going to jump into Romans the 8th chapter and let's read the first 16 verses and we'll find these seven, bless seven blessings there seven of the blessed fruits of the Spirit in us and the first one is who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit so I'm going to go through the seven blessings here and then we'll go through them individually again again this is very detailed and we want to we want to be very detailed here and um, really go after this so who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit the whole of our conduct is under the rule of the Spirit that's what that's all about number one number two for the law of life to the law of, of, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death the spirit brings us into freedom so we're going to go through these seven blessings here and then we're going to go through them individually and look at them and see what it, what it is like to live in the spirit and walk in the spirit and live a life in the spirit number three they that are of the spirit ye are in the spirit the spirit dwells in you so the Christian has a divine nature God's spirit is in him for the things of the spirit to be spiritually minded is life and peace mind means disposition to mind the things of the spirit is to have a spiritual disposition and we'll, again we'll go into these things in, in some detail here five if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body you shall live the spirit makes a death to sin an actual reality in our bodies six as many are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god divine guidance Number seven, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. So what we have in this chapter is the description of the normal Christian life. And this is for every believer. Where something's in danger by talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. But it's possible to have the baptism of the Spirit for special gifts and still be carnal. So nothing can take us back when the Holy Spirit gets entire possession of our inner life. And all may have the gifts of power for work, and all must have the fitness for a full life of God. But let us seek Him and be filled with Him. So all of us can be filled with the, with the, with the have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and live in the Spirit all the time. So let's go back to number one. The Christian is a man who walks after the Spirit. In Galatians it is said, if we, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what is my walk? My walk is my conduct, what the Bible calls my conversation, my course of life, my external manner of life. So here I'm told as a Christian, God will enable me to walk after the Spirit with the Spirit as my inspiration all the time and life in the Spirit all the time unconverted men walk after the flesh the flesh leads them and tells them what to do the Christian can come into a life of the Spirit in it he acts in it he walks he is a continual hidden guidance of the Spirit of God molding and shaping and walking his life what a beautiful thought 
I may be a minister if I walk after the Spirit. That does not mean that I am to pray for the Spirit just before I preach. This is what most of us do. And other things live after the flesh. No, this is not what God wants. God wants us to walk in the Spirit all the time. So I need the Spirit so that when I sit down at dinner, when my temper might be tempted to rise, in my business, in trials of any kind, I may feel the power of the Holy Spirit working in me and moving me. All my walk is to be according to the Spirit. And again, this is the test. Uh, my temper, my will, um, murmuring, um, my attitude. Again, if I live a life in the Spirit, uh, I, I, I'll watch what I say. Uh, I will be, um, I'll be mostly in a very positive m- mode. I'll have peace and joy, purpose and fulfillment in my life. So Paul says in the second verse, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, this is number two, has made me free from the law of sin and death. What a powerful script piece of scripture. The law of the Spirit of life had made me free from the law of sin and death. So we know there are two powers, the power of the Spirit and the power of sin. Which is stronger? Paul tells me, so therefore God tells me, that the power of the Holy Spirit is stronger. And the power of the Holy Spirit can make me free from the law of sin and death if I trust Him. The last root of sin being exterminated, exterminated, freedom and dominion over sin. Again, this is important because I know I work with a lot of Christians who are in bondage to sin. And uh, pornography and addiction, uh, drug addiction, are two very, you know, that's the power of sin. And that can be broken. We can get to a place where we have dominion over sin. And this life in the Spirit is the main key to this. Dying to self is also, but dying to self and, and, and a life in the Spirit are one and the same thing, which we talked about here. But the tendency to evil remains in the end, as long as we have this body. But the spirit of life in Christ makes me free from the law of sin to such an extent that it has no power over me. So the life in the spirit, with the law of the spirit, uh, sin has no power over me. My enemy is there, but he cannot touch me. 1 John 5.18 Number 3. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. When we see of the Spirit, after the Spirit, in the Spirit, the Spirit of God in you, all these expressions are used to express the one thought of the closeness and the reality of the blessed union by which the Holy Spirit takes possession of me. I am in Him and He is in me, just as a man is in the air and the air is in Him. The air is in my lungs and I am in the air that surrounds me. The two things go together. I go into, into the fresh air and the fresh air comes into me. So it is with the Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit takes possession of me. He is in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in, is in Him. He is after the Spirit, and the very nature, the divine nature of the Spirit is in Him. Have, have we ever thought about this? How wonderful the Spirit of God becomes, the very Spirit of my life. He comes into every being, and just as my thinking and willing and feeling is my very nature, so, is, so it is with the Holy Spirit. I become partaker of the divine nature. He enters deep, deep into me and preserves my whole inner inner life. This is what God wants. This is the kind of life God wants us to live in. That's why Paul, again in in Corinthians here and in Ephesians and also in Galatians, talks about this about the life in the spirit. The spirit of God is in me, and I am in the spirit of God. Number four, they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. The word mind means generally it's used of the intellect, but here it means something else. By mind we mean disposition. To be a spiritual man and man is to have the disposition of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly minded is a mind that has a spirit and disposition of heaven, a disposition of Jesus. If the Holy Spirit comes in and takes possession of my disposition, I shall have the mind of Christ. God's word says, love thy neighbor as thyself. You have tried hard but failed because this is not our natural state. A life in the Spirit is a place where I can love whom, whom I hate it. The love of God is neither a wonderful mystery. When it becomes ours, the more un- unlovable a man is, the more we love him. The more unworthy a man is, the more love is, manifest, is magnified in loving him. And again, this is, can only can be done in the, with the Holy Spirit uh, in the Holy Spirit, in a life in the Spirit. We try to do this in a natural and we fail. 
you f we find it so hard to keep our tempers. There is just, this is just another reason for this. You're not spiritually minded. You have had him in some measure, but he must fill you deeper and deeper. Again, the temperament, our tempers, again, our attitudes, what we say. These things tell us what what kind of, if we're in, in, a, in a carnal state or in, or in the spiritual state. So number five, if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall, be, you shall live. The word mortify simply means to cause to die. If you make dead the deeds of the body, you shall live. So the man who is given over the body to the Spirit uh, to do his work, and if that doesn't happen, the body becomes a, a trouble to us all. You know, we know how much sin comes out of the body. And many Christians never understand that it is the deeds of the body that must be made dead. The deeds of the body. We must mortify, mortify the deeds. But it's very hard and in fact impossible until we begin to see that it is only through the Holy Spirit who is the mighty power of God. So living this life in the Spirit and, and completely giving up self and mortifying the deeds of the flesh... This is where this is where this is where we can walk, and this takes time. It, it's it's we have to practice this. Again, temper temper is very much a sin of the flesh. It is in me. It is it is my it is my selfhood. A bundle of nerves is nothing but a bundle of self. So self is also the issue here that we're trying to get away from the carnal state. So therefore, the Holy Spirit is able to mortify the deeds of the body, and to reign through it all with this divine peace and power again it's supernatural <laughs> if, if you want to have the deeds of the body mortified beware of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes if you want to have your body the temple of the Holy Spirit if you want to live a holy life you must be filled with the Spirit your body too must be under the power of the Holy Spirit where it says we're crucified with Christ we're dead and then it adds therefore because we're dead mortify therefore your members my most regenerated life is life out of death, a life dead to sin in Christ. We must die to self. Some people say it's too hard. And we look at the Christians of old when they, they gave their lives to keep their body under. And some of the most earnest would go to solitary caves. And there they found themselves tempted even more than ever with evil spirits. Again, we can't do this in the carnal. We can't do this in the flesh. It must be done in the spirit. They were trying to be holy by self-mortification. We, we see this today. But they did not succeed and you will not, we will not succeed. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. If you are willing to claim and receive the power of the Holy Spirit, this thing can be done. It was the Holy Spirit that took Christ to Calvary. So number six, as we move on through the seven blessings here in, in Romans. As many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. There, here you have the leading of the Holy Spirit. And again, I just want to make say here very quickly that, you know, uh, leading by the Spirit of God, if we see something in the Word of God that says, lay hands on the sick, then we do what the Word of God says. Um, people say, well, I wasn't led to do this. No, if, if, if you see something in the Word of God that clearly says what we're supposed to do, that is the leading of the Holy Spirit also. Um, so whatever you're seeing in the Word of God, uh, that's what we need to do. When we know the mind of the Spirit in special circumstances, if in your daily life you'll say, Lord, let me know what my conduct today should be. Again, this is talking about not what we do in the Word of God. This is talking about your temper, how you live, how you walk, your daily, your daily activities, your daily thinking. This is exactly the life of the Lord Jesus if you remember, he said, I can't do anything of myself, of myself. The words I speak are not my own. It's what the Father showed me to do that I do. This is the kind of life, the real Christian life that the New Testament is talking to us about. And this is what we're trying to get across here to say that we can live this life in the Spirit, which is a life of peace and joy, purpose and fulfillment. As the example is with Jesus, he was always listening to the voice of God and was led by God. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't? Wouldn't it? Would we? Would we not be willing to sacrifice everything for that, that we might be led by the Spirit all the time? I must give up having any form of will of my own. 
I must desire above everything to lead a holy life like Jesus. We might say this is hard, but it's not hard. This is the most blessed life. It is, it, it's exactly the life Jesus lived. It is not a privilege to have the blessed God lead us and guide me all the way in everything. And he really has promised to do that, if we will allow him to do that. And finally, we come to number seven in Romans. Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. What a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful scripture. So the spirit dwelleth with our spirit. The spirit that has been described in the previous verses as leading us, making us spiritually minded, mortifying the deeds of the body. This is the spirit of adoption. This encompasses the whole thing here, the spirit of adoption, where we say, Abba, Father. This is the spirit that bear witnesses that I am a son of God. And again, I would recommend that you really, you know, um, spend some time on this scripture here. A lot of Christians don't realize that um, just when you got saved, it's the same type of thing. After a few months you got saved, you realize supernaturally, not you didn't work that out with your intellect, but you realize supernaturally that something happened. You got saved. You now know if you died, you'd go to heaven. You know that Jesus is real. This is the same thing. The Spirit bear, bears witnesses that I am a son of God, and it's an individual, personal thing. And each one of us need to get to that place where we know that the Spirit is, in bears witness to my spirit that I am a son. It's a, and it is. It's the. It's it's a, a knowing. It's a supernatural knowing, just like it is when you got saved. When the spirit bears witness to my spirit, I, I don't have to feel or try or struggle for the relationship. But God reveals Himself to me as my Father. So the living Father makes us know what it means to be dwelling in love and dwelling in God. The Father shall send the Comforter that He may abide with you forever. All these expressions are found in Romans, the 8th chapter. Walk in the Spirit, being made free by the Spirit from the law of sin and death. Being in the Spirit, having the Spirit dwell in us through the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the body. Being led by the Spirit, having the Spirit of adoption. We can see from all these expressions and <laughs> all these um, words that are expressed by Paul in, 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 in Romans 8 that, that obviously God wants us to walk in the Spirit, being made free by the Spirit. It's all about the Spirit. So again, this is, this is the, the seven blessings in, in Romans 8, talking about being led by the Spirit. I call, I call it the life in the Spirit. And again, it finishes off with having the Spirit of adoption. But you can see here the contrast between the life in the Spirit and the carnal life that, uh, that Paul was uh, warning the Corinthians about. And again, this takes time. It takes uh, effort on our behalf. And again, unlike righteousness, this is not a, this is not a gift. This has to be worked on. This is holiness, sanctification, and uh, needs to be worked on. And uh, but it's a great illustration here of the seven blessings in Romans. That when you look at it deeply, it, uh, when you look at it closer closely, you can see exactly what Paul, the contrast he's trying to make with this uh, this life in the spirit. What a wonderful blessing we have uh, from Paul in Romans eight. So to finish up on this life in the spirit. Uh, we need to go to Galatians 5.22 where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love. So we read that love is a fulfillment of the whole law. And this is a test by which to try all of our thoughts about the Holy Spirit and all of our experience about the holy life. Has this been our daily habit to seek the being filled with the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of love? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Has it been your, our experience that the more you have of the Holy Spirit, the more loving you become? Which is again <clears throat> the essence of the life in the Spirit. Is that the more you become like Jesus, the more you will love people. We come as the Holy Spirit, as a Spirit of love. And what does it mean that God is love? We have the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. The most perfect definition of love is love seeketh, not its own. So we're taught that the great mark of the believer is that he is to be a man of love. Look, just look how little the world understands this. How little the church understands this. How little it is preached or proved in practice. That love is actually the chief thing for every believer to set his heart upon. We see in the church today and you know, for centuries the, the denominations and the squabbling and the bitterness and the strife between the denominations. 
And again, I, I, when we look at Jesus and how he wants us to live this life in the Spirit, and that love is loving people, loving our neighbors, loving uh, our fellow man, is really where, what it's all about. And how little can believers say before God? How, how, how little can we say this? That we know that I pray for one thing, fill me with love. How little we pray that, all of us. Um, we, we don't really pray that. But yet, that is the essence. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The Holy Spirit comes from heaven and sheds the love of God in, in our hearts. And we are all one heart and one soul. And again, this is this is becoming the idea here is that the Holy Spirit wants us to become more like Jesus. So this life in spirit, we want the Holy Spirit to come from heaven and shed the love of God in our hearts, to make us like Jesus, that we can love the unlovable, and to put on, therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. And again, this sounds like the life that Jesus led. Come and follow me, I am humble of heart, Jesus said. So if we, ha- if we are to have the Holy Spirit, we must give up ourselves. Give up self to the life of love. And that's what it means. It's giving up self to the life of love and loving others. Have I been filled with the Spirit of love? You know what John says, No man had seen the Father at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. That is, I can't see God but as a compensation, I can see my brother, and if I love him, God dwells in me. Is this really true, that I cannot see God, but I must love my brother, and God will dwell in me? Yes, it is. <laughs> Loving my brother is the way to real fellowship with God. You know what John further says in the most solemn test, First John 4.20, If a man says he loves God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he had seen, how can he love God? whom he had not seen. So love is to be the fruit of the Spirit all day and every day. And it is this is the supreme test of life in the Spirit. As we grow in the Spirit and as God helps us, especially looking at the seven blessings there, here in, in Romans that we covered, and as we work on this, we work our salvation with fear and trembling, we, we work on this. We allow the Holy Spirit to really move and take over in our lives. We give up self and we start to live like Jesus. And that's the idea. Love is to be the fruit of the Spirit all day and every day. And that is the life that Jesus has shown us and that we can actually walk in that place. That's what this teaching was all about from Paul to the Corinthians, that this is possible. This life in the Spirit is absolutely possible. And it's a gradual thing. It's a daily thing. Uh, It's a pick up your cross daily. And as you move in this and allow the Holy Spirit to take over, we can live this life completely in the spirit again a life of peace and joy purpose and fulfillment a life after jesus